this is not going to be too long, so I'm just going to give it away, you know. Like the Red Hot Chili Pepper song, give it away, give it away, give it away now. But going back, yes, there was a time earlier this year I received an, in an inbox from my former fiance, Faith. You, you all remember her if you've been on my social media page or followed me for the last couple years, you know. There was a time, this was around, around the time my ex from Mexico broke up with me actually, which I won't get into because that's something that's not related to this video, you know. If you knew the story of me and my former fiance very well, we had a son together who died during birth and a lot of ticking time bomb moments, let's put it that way, like in, it was a very bad situation for both me and that person, which was her, you know, and when I broke up with her, well, when I, when we ended, like, back in June of 2014, I was relieved, you know, like, the Iron Maiden song from the Number of the Beast album, you know, that song goes, I'm a prisoner, I'm a free man, that's how I exactly felt when me and her split. Because it was a long time coming, you know, I mean, I mean, we were not happy together those last 18 months anyway, so it was best to do to make that decision, you know. But the, but her actions is what made me want to distance myself her, from her even more and more and more as time went on. And there is a possibility she might have had something to do with the breakup between me and my ex from Mexico. I'm not doubting it. I'm not going to over speculate about it or think about it too much, you know. Because it's just, it's just going to bring more stress, unnecessary stress, you know, and a lot of other bad things too. But, uh, I, and yes, there was a time that, you know, she, she, that I didn't play music for three years because of her, you know, dealing with her shit, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you know. I guess you could say I'm kind of a bitter person, you know. I mean, if someone does you wrong like that, in, especially if it was going on for about 18 months, you know, it makes perfect sense and it is kind of understandable you had to get away from that shit and cut ties you know it is a legitimate reason to cut ties you know but you know she did send me like this uh, around the time april started she sent me this wall post on my facebook wishing me the best of luck for my love life it, it seemed like this was the sign of reconciliation we didn't necessarily have to be together again which it was the best that we did not jump right back onto it. I knew it was the best. She knew it was the best because we don't want to suffer through six years of hell even more. Six more years of hell dealing with the same bullshit, you know. And God knows how much shit I had to deal with when I was with Faith at the time, you know. But it, it was a... I mean, I did... She did message me sometime before that. I told her how it is. I told her, you fucked up. You did this. You did that. Blah, blah, blah. I don't want to deal with you. I I wish you nothing but the best. You fucked. You, I don't want nothing to do with you whatsoever. Because I was still very bitter about what happened. And who could blame me? I mean, I know they always say in life that life's too short to hold grudges and stuff like that. But if you go through six years of this, basically, of course you're going to feel some bitterness towards the situation to that person. But when she sent me that Facebook post on Heavy Sigma, me and Eric's band... Back in April, maybe it was a sign to reconsider the friendship because, as a matter of fact, she is the mother of my child, and you and I can't speak for him because he's not with us anymore, you know. So I gave it another shot, and at, at first I thought maybe it was a good idea to be friends with her again. But what she, but the, as time went on, old wounds reopened up, and what she was bringing to the table was not fucking good. I mean. She said I was ugly, I was, I'm never going to succeed in life and love, she didn't give a shit about me and Monique, my current fiance, a lot of bad shit, you know, like Nadia, like my friend Nadia said, who I've known for about 13, 14 years, she just doesn't want to see me happy or something, you know, and I figured, even though I did, did this favor for my, for our son at the time, just to be, just give it, just try to be friends with her at least, it was, what she was bringing to the table was more negative than positive and i don't want to overthink this honestly when it came to the aftermath of me and faith really but you know 
But but let's just put it this way: what was going on? What she was what was going on between me and her as friends did not turn out the way it should have had. She was being the same mean-hearted, mean-spirited person that I dealt with for that eighteen months alone. So it, it's just gonna it's just gonna open reopen old wounds. Let's put it that way. So. I said well, that day I I kissed Monique goodbye in Massachusetts like about seven weeks ago. We I we did have this falling out, and this it turns out this falling out might have to be permanent. As much as I hate to say this to my son, I don't want to. I don't think she she ever put into consideration about how I really feel and and anything like that. I mean, wish me luck, my ass, when she was do, putting all this kind of negative shit, putting me down and all that kind of stuff. You know. Make it seem like my past is such a burden. It's going to haunt me in later years. I didn't want any part of that whatsoever. So that's why I cut ties with Faith. I, I really do get... I have no regrets that we officially ended. Because it was a long time coming, you know? God knows. I mean, if, if we've had a falling out in early 2013. I should have left it that way. Because it was just not a happy situation for the both of us. I could have been a stronger man and say, fuck it, don't be with her again. But I guess out of my personality as a, as a partner is loyalty and working things out in the long run. But since we came to seven to, to, to 18 months of not going anywhere, we had to split. And it was for the best, you know, for me and for her. So life moves on, you know. I mean, I am engaged for a second time now, which is awesome. But, you know... It's some just some things are just better left in the past and they're just like dust in the wind or just memories in the closet. I prefer to leave it that way when it comes to me and Faith, you know. And this is my last word about me and her. We tried to reconcile, but I was having, but what she was bringing to the table caused more harm than good. When we when when we, when that when when things were when we did speak here and there, so I'm just gonna leave it to that. She can. I don't care what she does with her life. I don't give a fuck if her mom who hates me dies. Honestly, I don't give a fuck if, if she goes through a divorce, anything like that, you know, or whatever, whatever, whatever she does with her life. She's on her own, basically. I want nothing a part of what what she had, what she has to offer, or in or just in general, you know. But I'll just leave it to that. I'll let karma take care of what happens later on in life, really, you know, and I just want to be the best person I possibly can be for myself and other people around me and not repeat the sins of ex-girlfriends or former friends, of course, as obvious, and just go from there, you know. Good evening, Facebook and YouTube. Um, this is going to be a summary of why the original Patrick Lou band from 2011 from 2009 to 2012 did not work out actually let me just mute my TV real quick actually you know okay so I was going to see a shoe East Bay from 2008 to 2011 and I met some people who are a part of Patrick Lou band or were in the previous lineup at some point actually and the first to join was, of course, Jeremy, and he did he did contribute to some things in Patrick Luban for the Let It Rise and Against record and stuff like that, you know, and he even wrote the music, or me and him co-wrote the music to the song Little Miss Preppy, which is a track I written about Ashley Tisdale, who was one of my Hollywood celebrity, oh, I love you, baby, kind of crush, basically, you know, and it was actually one of our most well-known tracks over the years, as looking back, you know, it's it, a part of the Patrick Lou band legacy does include the song me and Jeremy did called Little Miss Preppy. And he contributed to some other ideas for that record, but somehow, you know, he, 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 he wasn't, he, I didn't know where he was heading as far as things goes, you know, but I was, I really like him though, as a person, it was, it was a really a big transition because Eddie Blackburn just left two years prior to that and I was struggling to find a way to rebuild this project in a in a totally different way because Patrick the way Patrick Luban worked was we started in high school when I was 15 or 16 back in 2001 but we weren't we weren't called Patrick Luban at the time we were experimenting with many different types of names like samurai sorcerers Famiglia, um silent minister and all, all this 
and Pretendo Box, Your Audio to Riot, Dexter Run, the list goes on. It wasn't until like after Power Trip disbanded, which was my previous man I did with Zach, Eddie involved as well, David, and Corey. And I, I hate to mention his name, Augusto. I really hate to mention these guys' names who I'm on bad terms with. But they were a part of history, so I had to give them credit, you know. And, and that band basically split in early 2008. So I, it wasn't until like maybe like six or seven months after that that it was really Patch Glue Band, which is which I announced in, on a MySpace blog or, or a SoundClick blog through, through the whole World Wide Web, the Internet. And letting everyone know that I'm, I'm actually going to take a new project I'm going to do musically. But do it in a totally different kind of way, you know. The concept of Patrick Lou Band was, is basically, at the time, was not just a rock band or a garage band or your local cheap amateur sounding bar, punk rock bar band, you know. But it was intended to be a multimedia concept, basically. It wasn't going to be something that... It was just going to be, oh, let's play music together and blah, 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 this. It was going to be something that reached through many different types of mediums to empower other people in this world and just overcome the struggles of life, you know. And and going back, when Jeremy did his thing in Patch Band in 2009 for the Let It Rise and Against album, we were just trying to figure out how to record stuff and everything like that at the time. But he somehow, there was a lot of things which were personal and creatively different, which I'm not going to get into. That didn't work out, so he basically left right after that album was finished. I had two people who I thought were my friends. One of them I kind of do respect in some ways still, even though we've grown apart a hell of a lot since then. It was Little David and Greg, actually. I've known them since CHV Spain. They were living in the same hometown I was living in at the time called Antioch, you know. Antioch, California. Good old Antioch, you know. But it, But the thing was, like... There was definitely a lack of unity in the Patrick Lou band from 2009 to 2012. You know how Blink-182, not trying to compare myself to them, when, when they got back together, they were like, oh, we have these different projects, we have these different priorities in life, we have these other things going on, so let's just collaborate through our own studios at home, record everything part by part, send each other the files on email or Skype, and just copy and paste everything and make music that way. That's what Patrick Luban did from 2009 to 2012. And Greg and David were hired at, well, not David Arcel, David Hunter. They were, David, little David, or try, was David Hunter, and Greg were a part of Patrick Luban. And the reason why there was a lack of unity in Patrick Luban with the with the lineup, including Jeremy himself and, my, and me, little David and Greg, and, you know, we all lived in different parts of the Bay Area, so it was hard to get everyone in the same room together at the same time. Plus, we had a lot of different priorities in life, like projects and solo side projects and college, jobs, stuff like that, social life, you know. And I could totally understand that, of course, you know. And But somehow, with, with, through, the, through the power of the digital t world and technology we have now, we're able to record... We don't necessarily have to be abandoned, be in the same room together to make music. We could just fuck around on Skype and send each other part by part and put, cut and paste these ideas together. And that's what we did for Murder Bay in 2011, actually. There was a, I mean, I was going through a, a rough situation with You Know Who at the time, which I'm not going to get into, which you, you which you pretty much know the whole story now if you follow me for, throughout the years, of course. But the Tau Kappa Epsilon in UC Berkeley... Or University of California Berkeley sent me an email saying, "Hey, you want to play a benefit concert for 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 us guys and stuff like that." And I was really down for it because I haven't played a show since 2007 when Power Trip did their last and only tour locally, you know. And I contacted little David Greg about it. Kept, I mean, I kind of feel bad for like pressuring them or coming or basically trying to persuade them to, to do the show with me, but they couldn't make it. At the time, I was very hurt, you know. Because I, I, I really wanted to play a show, but I couldn't understand their reasons for it because, you know, they didn't have the time to do so. So I ended up emailing the, the chapter leader at UC Berkeley for TKE and Tau Cap Epsilon said that we couldn't do it, basically. So you might, well, good luck to the show nonetheless, because the show must go on, you know. After after Murder Bay, me and Greg and would we'll, we'll do these we'll do these secret shows in the Bay Area. And well, actually, me and Greg would we'll do these secret shows in Antioch, California in, 20, in summer 2011. 
and our idea for like the most like, our idea for Patrick Luban for this show, this tour was it was gonna be like a surprise tour, a secret a secret concert tour. Where we're gonna be like playing in public places, like busking and shit like that, right? But the trick was we were gonna fit, videotape everything we played outside of our own garage or in our own house while we're doing a house show in front of like five or ten people and broadcast it later on YouTube and Facebook and all the other social media platforms out there, you know, and we did that and we had, very, I had a lot of fun doing it, honestly, then suddenly I had to move back to San Francisco because, you know, you know, I was, because which, because I wanted to, I was going to look for a job out there actually and I, and just start my, and just restart my life as an adult really, you know what I mean? So, after, so basically, take off this hat, um, so, after Murder Bay and, the, and those secret shows wrapped up, I was preparing for ideas, which, which, which was going to be possibly the next Patrick Luban album, you know? And me and Greg had these discussions and stuff like that regarding the music, and I appointed him as the leader of the band, or one of the co-leaders of the band, actually, and David Hunter was going to be involved, too. I'm not sure about my best friend Knuckles, a.k.a. David Arcel, what his role was at the time, but he was... He was very keen on it, and also, my former fiancé was actually going to be a part of it, too, at one point, actually. You know, she was living in Texas at the time, you know, and... But the problem was, I brought the material I recorded, in my, it was stored on my hard drive. I showed it to Greg and, and stuff like that. Little David was absent throughout 95% of the sessions, because he had, whatever reason it was, I'm not, I don't remember, but he, he probably had his own things he had, he wanted to do at the time, so this what, so this is an example of the lack of unity involved, but, by 2012, my relationships with Greg and Faith and Little David were still cordial at this point, but, it's, but, but then again, like, we, there was a lack of unity, unity, because I was living in San Francisco, and I just moved back to the city I was born and raised in, Greg and David were in Antioch, Faith was in Texas, and I was, and the other David, David Arceo, was, but my homie for 10 years was in Daly City, so there was no way we'd get get across to, to do this kind of stuff together, but as time wore on, it, it turns out we only practiced maybe three times in 2012, or four times, and and I, and, we, and by this time, if, if it became apparent that, like, you know, we weren't, we, we weren't really on the same page with, the, with everything that was going on. The way that the old Patch Lou band worked was, and made it also d implode at the same time, like what happened with Power Trip was, you have five or six different people of different types of backgrounds, different types of musical influences and stuff like that, and different mindsets and experience and priorities and all that rolled into one band, just couldn't really get, get, get everything to go as needed, you know, and... The thing, but, and, Patrick Luban was actually going through a lot of creative ups and downs, and there was, there was a lot of hurt feelings and stuff like that, there was a lot of tensions, and me, and, and there was things that Greg might have done that I still haven't really forgiven him for, well, I actually did forgive him, but it's, it still makes me cringe, or really not speak of it in a very positive way in later years, you know, because, it became so, so somewhat of a toxic environment for me and David Arcel, actually, because he actually, what, because I, I was going to this one church, right, that, because, you know, I was, because Greg and David, little David converted me to Christianity at the time, because I was already a straight up atheist up to that point, and while, while it was cool being Christian for a while, it turns out that the, my experience with religion g g was sour, because what what I had to deal with when with Greg and Faith at the time, you know, and I remember Greg said to me while we were driving back home from one day, back to my parents' house, which originally where Patrick Luban recorded and did those house shows during that era. He said to me that my grandfather is burning in hell because he was not a Christian; he wasn't saved by Jesus. So I was like, "What the fuck was that all about?" You know, I was like, really like pissed off at him for that actually because like you know I lost if you know me very well I lost my grandfather when I was three or four and, and that was like one of the most traumatic experiences I had to go through early on in life you know and I, I was really caught off guard by that then there was one time I was interested in actually 
becoming a church band band member actually at Gordon Hills. He told me flat out that I'm a sh- I'm, that I'm not good enough to do it, and I was like really offended by that. I was so offended that like uh, you're in my band, dude. You're like saying all this shit and talking down my my musical talent, my abilities and stuff like that. Look at you, Greg. You never wrote an original song in your life. I'm, I'm gonna give you credit though. You're a talented musician, but you never wrote a goddamn original song in your life, dude. I mean, you know, I mean, not just that. I mean, like if you want to make it in this business, you have to write your own tunes, bro. You know and we did patch things up long afterwards, a, a couple weeks later, but then it turns out that this wasn't really going anywhere. That's why the Patch Blue Band basically split by the end of 2012, and there was a lot of things that went on behind closed doors between me, Faith, David, Faith, me, Greg, D- David and Greg that I'm not going to get into, of course, but we had, but I cut ties with basically both Faith and Greg because of those reasons, you know. And uh, and they're very personal and they're very difficult to elaborate on because you know the more I talk about it is it's gonna really you know bring a lot of bad memories and skeletons in the closet pretty much you know I I I mean surprisingly I've forgiven Faith and David for what they've done I know Faith and Greg for what they did actually but I still haven't like forgotten about what they've done actually and you know it was really. Si- it was a really shitty situation for me, and I didn't really like it look, looking back, you know. It was a very toxic environment for me, and I, I didn't even pl- wanted to play music for like two, three years straight because of what I was dealing with at the time. I mean, in 2012, because I they didn't take the music I wanted I wanted to contribute to the band, I t- instead formed Heavy Sigma, now known as Steel Lions, and did two records with them, but then suddenly there was like a lot of things up that, um, which I already explained in in previous video blogs and posts on Facebook that I didn't play music for like a couple years. Then I suddenly came back and I've been, I've been more rejuvenated than ever creatively and, and musically, you know. I'm, I'm very happy that I came back to music and not included Patch Gluban with with Greg or Faith involved because, you know, it was not... Because they, they, they done more bad than good, you know, in the long run. And it's something that hasn't left me to this very day. Sadly to say, I forgive them for what they did, but I can't forget about it, you know. But it, but you know, it doesn't excuse what they did. Of course, you know. Hope, I mean, I, I choose not to deal with them for my own reasons, you know. Of course, so now we are in the year 2016, and Patrick Luban already released three albums within 2015 and this year. It's like holy shit. There's like a lot of creativity going on right here. So I'm really happy how things have turned out since I came back to music with Patrick Luban and. I'm doing diverse with Jim Jules and David Arsale, of course, and we're we're doing fine actually since we came back to the scene, you know. And I'm really happy for it. I'm forever grateful for all the things that happened since I got out of a very shitty situation and returned to the music scene in a more mature, don't give a fuck kind of attitude and just go with the flow kind of thing. And that's why I'm doing this today.